today out of the book of Exodus reminds us once again that God calls his people, God empowers his people, God expects his people to obey. Even when we give our excuses and pretend that we can't do it, and in the flesh we cannot do it, yet God is faithful and provides all that is necessary so that we can obey. It's merely a matter of saying, yes, Lord, I will obey. Now, you and I have had a call placed upon our lives also, as Moses had upon his in this text that we read today. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee. Our Lord Jesus Christ has done the same with us. We find that in the opening chapter of the book of Acts. We have been sent. We have been commissioned to reach the world and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have been empowered to do it by the Spirit of God. Now, last week, you recall, we started looking at the first of the permanent service gifts that God has given to us so that the church might fulfill what has been called the Great Commission, so that we might do what God has told us to do. But that first gift is not the only gift that is given to the church. We think of that gift as, oh, that's the gift that has to do the job of going out and leading people to Christ. And indeed, that is a very special gift for doing so, the gift of evangelist. But it's not merely the gift of evangelist who has the responsibilities of reaching others for Christ. You come in contact with people every day, and you do not know whether they are among the elect or not among the elect. 
And the job that you and I have, that God has given to us, is to share the good news of Christ. And then allow God to take his word and use it to reach the hearts of those whom he has chosen. Last week we gave a contrast between the Arminian view, the free will view, contrasting that with the biblical doctrines of predestination, election, and irresistible grace. For God's grace is irresistible. We noted that the Arminian view puts the evangelistic success emphasis on man. You have to have the right surroundings, you have to have the quiet music, the emotional stories of dying sinners, the high pressure from the evangelist, people who prime the pump by going forward, and if only you put enough pressure on those people out there, you can get some converts. In contrast, the biblical view puts the emphasis on God and on the supernatural nature of the word of God proclaimed. The elect will believe when the Holy Spirit sovereignly applies the word of God to their hearts and irresistibly draws them to Christ. Our responsibility, for God has given us responsibility, though he is sovereign, our responsibility is to clearly and accurately preach the word, make God's offer of salvation plain, and invite sinners to believe. God's responsibility is to irresistibly draw people to Christ. I'd like to make two observations to enlarge on what I said about that last week. I've been thinking about it and looking at the broad spread of Christianity across America, all the way from the farthest reaches of Armenian doctrine to the farthest reaches of Calvin's doctrine and everything else that falls somewhere along the spectrum in between, I began to wonder, why is it that in churches such as ours we do not see people coming to Christ? We do not see, for the most part, in reform circles, people being saved and being added to the church. I have come up with a couple of observations. They may not be complete. They may not be totally accurate. But in, in mulling this over since last week, here are my observations. If our Armenian friends clearly preach the true gospel that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and that's what Paul says is the gospel 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 3 and 4 if they're truly preaching that the Holy Spirit can and does irresistibly draw people to Christ even though the Arminian may be wrong on why God is doing it. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. God will grant to the Arminians success, not because of their methods, but because of the promises of God concerning the elect, even though the Arminians don't believe in the doctrine of election. The second thought that I had is, it seems that the Arminians are growing in numbers because they have a genuine concern for lost people. It often seems, at least in the small circle in which I find myself in reform circles, the sense we know, and we do know, that God will save the elect I'm afraid that sometimes we ignore the fact that God uses people to accomplish his goals. In other words, we disobediently ignore our own responsibility and our own accountability to personally share the gospel and invite friends and neighbors to hear the word of God and trust Christ. Hence, God ironically blesses the less biblically informed, if I can put that in quotes, the less biblically informed Arminians with the elect being saved in their churches, resulting in church growth. Why do Arminians have a genuine concern? 
I think it is frequently going back to what Paul states in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 and 15. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. It's the gospel, but what motivates us to preach the gospel is the love of Christ that constrains us. That word translated constraineth, suneko, means to squeeze together, to compress, to compel. Though we might not like to admit it, there are many Armenians who have a genuine love for Christ, which compels them to boldly and compassionately share the gospel with the lost. I'm afraid that often we are so doctrinally correct that we have lost our love and compassion for the lost. The church at Ephesus is what comes to my mind in the book of Revelation. They were a good, sound, doctrinal, Bible-preaching church, square away on the doctrine of election, as you can see in the epistle to the Ephesians. Three chapters on doctrine, three chapters on practice, but they had lost the practice and they focused on doctrine. And they had lost their first love. And the Lord Jesus Christ himself warns that church, because they have lost their first love, they'd better repent or he will come and pluck them out of their place. History tells us that Ephesus did not repent. They never regained their first love. I've walked the empty streets of Ephesus, and the church is there no more. The problem not lies not with the truth of the doctrine of election, which we certainly believe. But I think the problem lies with our own hardness of heart. My third observation is this. We can point to false conversions among the Armenians because some supposed converts fall away and never grow or bear any fruit. They came forward on the basis of an emotional appeal, not on the basis of trusting Christ. But we can also point to false converts in Reformed churches who think they are saved because they were raised as covenant children in some Reformed church somewhere. But they've never personally trusted Christ for salvation. You see, when you truly believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are not only saved, but it changes your life. The things that you do, the way in which you live. To us, Paul gives these warnings, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith that was written to a church of believers. It wasn't written to the lost crowds out there somewhere, the unwashed masses of humanity. Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. He writes to Titus in chapter 1, verse 16, They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. Dear friends, those are serious warnings. Fourth, lest I come across as saying you can never use any illustrations, which are often used by the Armenians. It is not wrong to use true illustrations to portray the serious nature of rejecting the indiscriminately given gospel call, which is given to all, although only the elect will hear and believe. Our Lord Jesus Christ often used illustrations in the parables and elsewhere to show the deadly nature of wrong choices. For example, in Luke 13, there were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, nay! But except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. 
or those eighteen upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them? Think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Our Lord clearly used those kinds of illustrations to warn people of judgment to come. Both John Calvin and Martin Luther were gifted evangelists as well as pastor teachers and not merely theologians. There is no spiritual gift of theologian. They both held to the biblical truth concerning biblical evangelism and also had a great love and compassion for reaching the lost. Let me prove that to you. Calvin not only saw Geneva and the French-speaking cantons of Switzerland come to faith in Christ, but he was indirectly the evangelist of Europe, and was known as that, spreading the evangelical faith from Scotland to Transylvania. Thus, it is not surprising to learn that in less than 11 years, from 1555 to 1566, Calvin personally trained 121 men with the gift of evangelist and sent them into France where he had been forbidden to return. In their first four years, those pioneer evangelists founded and oversaw 2,000 new French Calvinist congregations. And that was certainly in the face of opposition from Rome. What we learned last week about the gift of evangelism, or the gift of evangelist in the New Testament, is that it is essentially what we would call church planting missionaries today. We saw that the word evangelist occurs only three times in the New Testament. First in Acts 21.8, where we read of Philip the Evangelist, one of the early deacons from Acts chapter 6, who was directed by the Spirit to leave the great Samaritan revival, and you'd think that certainly the evangelist ought to be there at the revival. And God sent him on a personal encounter mission with the Ethiopian eunuch. From there, the Spirit left him at Ashdod, one of the ancient... Philistine cities, it was known as Azotus in the days of the New Testament, but that's the city of Ashdod. And if you follow the New Testament chronological timeline, when we find him in Acts 21 again, it says he evangelized from Azotus all the way up to Caesarea. On that timeline, it took him 19 years to go 55 miles. That is a very slow pace. What was he doing? Well, he was evangelizing. He was planting churches. He had a normal family life. The evangelist who runs around and skips all over the country doing things and ignores his family is not the New Testament gift of evangelist. This man had a normal family life. It tells us about his four virgin daughters when we get to Acts 21, verses 8 and 9. Four unmarried girls that he had been involved in raising them. Second, the term evangelist we saw occurs in Ephesians 4.11, where it's listed as one of the four church leadership gifts. We've already looked at that passage. We'll not go back there again. Third, the term evangelist occurs in 2 Timothy 4.5, where young Timothy is exhorted, quote, to do the work of an evangelist. When we look at First and 2 Timothy and Titus, we normally refer to them as the pastoral epistles. And, of course, there is much in them that relates to pastoral care. But Timothy and Titus were both evangelists leading people to Christ, planting local churches, and teaching the churches until God raised up spiritual leaders in those churches. We saw that there were other men who had the gift of evangelist in the New Testament, including Paul and Barnabas, Timothy, Titus, Silas, John, Mark, Tychicus, and Luke. Now as we move to the next part of this, your new job, the gifts, we want to look at the underlying principles for every one of the spiritual gifts because you have at least one, and I'm convinced each of you, if you're saved, has more than one spiritual gift. We've already covered the temporary gifts. Those are gifts that are no longer being given. Apostle, prophet, healings, miracles, tongues, interpretation of tongues, and the gift of knowledge, which was the reception of new special revelation. Those seven gifts are no longer being given. What you see today when people claim they have those gifts is a counterfeit. But there are 15 service gifts that are still being given. We've looked in detail at the gift of evangelist because that's the one that frequently people don't understand very much about. But we want to learn the general principles that control all of the service gifts. Principle number one, every Christian has at least one supernaturally given gift, given at the moment of salvation by the Holy Spirit for the benefit of the entire church. 1 Corinthians 12.7 But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. 
that is, given to each one of you to profit all the rest of you. 2 Corinthians 12.11 But these all worketh that one and the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. You don't get to choose your gift. The Holy Spirit determines which gift or gifts you will receive. And it is given to everyone, the every man in this context is talking about the church, the believers, who are gifted by God, and it is given to everyone as the Holy Spirit chooses. Verse 11 and verse 18 make it clear you don't choose which gift you want. It's the Holy Spirit that chooses what he is going to give you. We saw in verse 11 just that last verse, giving to every man severally as he will. Verse 18 says, But now God hath set the members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased him. God is sovereign in the giving of the gifts. It's not a matter of your free will. It's not a matter of what you decide you want to do. And now you're going to serve God with what you decide you want to serve God with. God is the one who has gifted you. That means, for the use of that gift, you are accountable to Him. He's the one who's entrusted something to you. Now, what are you going to do with what God has entrusted to you? And He's told you it's to be used in the context of the body of Christ, the church. Principle number two, some permanent service gifts are what we would call every believer gifts. We find some of them stated that he's given it to every believer. Examples of this are the gift of faith and the gift of giving. Faith is the foundational gift both at the point of salvation and at the point of spiritual growth. We see that clearly true of salvation in Ephesians 2.8. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that, referring to faith, which is the nearest antecedent both in English and in Greek, and that faith, not of yourselves, it, faith, is the gift of God. The gift of faith underlies the exercise of every other spiritual gift and thus must be a, an every believer gift. We find it is true not only at the point of salvation but also in our spiritual walk. 2 Corinthians 5.7 For we walk by faith, not by sight. 1 Corinthians 16.2 Dealing with giving. Upon the first day of the week let every one of you not just some of you, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. He tells us it applies to all of us. He tells us when we're supposed to do it. He tells us why we're supposed to do it. So that they won't have to take up a special offering because they know Paul is on his way and they'd better have everything ready. He deals with that in some detail both in First and Second Corinthians. We'll talk about that more when we get to the gift of giving specifically. Principle number three. Sometimes we fail to exercise our gifts. We refuse to walk by faith or we refuse to give for carnal reasons. But that does not mean that the gift does not exist. Principle four, other permanent service gifts are restricted gifts. That is, God has given them only to a few people or in some cases has limited those gifts to men only. For example, the gift of pastor-teacher. And he gave some, not all, apostles, and some, not all, prophets, and some, not all, evangelists, and some, not all, pastors and teachers, Ephesians 4.11. That gift of pastor-teacher is a combination gift where it says pastors and teachers, that and that connects the two is what's called a copulative chi in Greek, indicating that the two nouns on either side of the word and refer to the same person. The gift of pastor-teacher is one of the four leadership speaking gifts listed in that verse. How is it that we know that that gift of pastor-teacher is never given to women? Well, because the Word of God says so. 1 Corinthians 14, 34. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience as also saith the law. This is true in the Old Testament, this is true in the New Testament. They are not permitted to speak. Laleo. That's the common word for talk. Any way of talking. That's why we don't allow women to give testimonies here in the worship services. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Now Paul knows he's going to get some flack from that, so he says in verse 36, What? Came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? 
If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, in other words, you don't even have to be a prophet or spiritual to get this one right, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments, not the suggestions, are the commandments of the Lord. He's been talking about women speaking in the church. It's in the context of the gift of tongues and prophet and of teaching. In other words, the charismatic churches are dead wrong when they have women bishops and women preachers and women evangelists, when they allow the women to get up and speak in church in tongues or interpret in tongues, because Paul says it is a shame and he uses a very, very harsh word for shame. The things that you can think of that are most shameful, he puts it in that category. If any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. He offers you only three options. Off, offers you only three options: prophet, spiritual, or ignorant. <laughs> the first two agree with the apostle Paul concerning the silence of women in the church. He says it to Timothy also. First Timothy 2:11. Let the women learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Those are pretty direct, pretty clear passages indicating that the woman has not the gift of evangelist and has not the gift of pastor teacher. Paul states this principle is based on three unchanging divine mandates. First of all, the divinely established order of authority, 1 Corinthians 11.3. But I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. That's the divinely established order of authority. It's not cultural because on either side of man being the head of the woman, we have God placing himself in his relationship to his son Jesus Christ. Secondly, the divinely established order of creation. 1 Corinthians 11.8 For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. That's the order of creation. That's an unchanging divine mandate. He emphasizes that in 1 Timothy 2, verses 11 through 14. Let the women learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression, the divinely established order of creation. Third, the divinely established order of purpose. 1 Corinthians 11.9 Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Adam wasn't created for Eve. Eve was created to be a helper who would be fit for Adam. Couldn't find one in all of the animal creation. So God sovereignly put Adam into a deep sleep, took a rib from his side, and formed Eve out of that rib. She was formed for a purpose, to be his helper. Conclusion, the biblical conclusion is that women are never given any of the leadership gifts in the church because God never violates the principles laid down in his word for the operation of the gifts. Principle number five, even during apostolic times, many of the gifts were restricted to only a few individuals. Now, before reading you the verses that prove this, I need to give you a very, very easy Greek lesson. In Greek, there are three ways to ask a question. You can ask a question expecting a yes answer, such as, your name is Sam, right? Answer, yes. Expecting a no answer, do you think that you can jump to the moon? Answer, no. Or, you can ask a question expecting an unknown answer. And so I ask you this question. What is the square root of 985.23? <laughs> now, unless I had looked it up, I would not have known the answer to that. And if you asked that question, probably you wouldn't know the answer either when you asked the question. The answer is, for those of you who are curious, 31.188373. But when you ask the question, you're expecting an unknown answer. Paul challenges the Corinthian church with a series of questions phrased in the Greek in such a way that it expects a no answer. 
In 1 Corinthians 12, 29, Paul asks the questions. Are all apostles? Answer, no. Are all prophets? Answer, no. Are all teachers? Answer, no. Are all workers of miracles? Answer, no. Have all the gifts of healing? Answer, no. Do all speak with tongues? Answer, no. Do all interpret? Answer, no. He specifically phrases it so that the reader must come to a no answer. It doesn't come across for us very clearly sometimes in English, but every one of those questions, the answer is no. Which you can point out to the charismatics, by the way, who say, you have to speak in tongues, you have to pray through until you get, quote, the gift. And speak in tongues because then you'll know that you're saved. Paul says, do all speak in tongues? Answer, no. Even in the apostolic church, even at Corinth where it was a big gift. It's interesting to note that all the gifts in these two verses were temporary sign gifts except the permanent service gift of teacher. Even in the early church, the gift of teacher was limited to a few. That, as we've pointed out in the past, is very similar to the Old Testament responsibilities of service because only a select few were priests and Levites, but they all had to serve God. Principle number six, all spiritual gifts are supernatural, not merely natural, and all are called spiritual gifts by the Greek text using the word charismata, which is the word the charismatics have picked up on uh, to name their movement, the charismatic movement. We noted last week that the supernatural spiritual gifts are not identical with the natural abilities that God gives even to pagans. There are many skilled communicators, even among God-haters, but they do not have the spiritual gift of teacher. You think of the different pro-evolutionists who are out there making hay uh, over ignorant Christians who do not understand the, the issues that are involved. Richard Dawkins, for example. He's a gifted teacher with a natural skill, but he does not have the spiritual gift of teacher. Likewise, there may be a believer who is a skilled communicator, but that does not necessarily mean that the believer has the gift of teacher. It's a special gift, a supernaturally given gift, for a specific purpose that we'll see when we get to that. Principle number seven. The spiritual gifts are essential, but God prioritizes the gifts as to their value in building up the church. We see that in 1 Corinthians 12, 28. God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that, miracles and gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Now, Paul doesn't give us a complete list here in this particular passage, but he gives us a sample to show relative importance of the gifts when they are weighed against each other. The words first, secondarily, thirdly, and after that are special words that list the gifts in order of importance. They're not merely enumerating the gifts. They are listing them in terms of their order of importance. In other words, the first most important gift listed here was apostle. The second most important gift listed was prophet. The third most important gift listed was teacher, and so on. Even in the early church, tongues was listed last in terms of its order of importance in this list. The modern charismatic movement has moved tongues to the top of the list. When you remove the temporary sign gifts listed in verse 28, you still have a relative order of importance among the service gifts that remain, teachers, helps, and governments. The other 12 service gifts fall into place within that list, as we'll see in other passages. Principle number eight. I know this is very didactic in what I'm doing, very teachy. But folks, we never hear this in Reformed circles. And a lot of Reformed young people have gotten dragged into the charismatic movement because they never heard it preached in the pulpit. And that is very grievous to me. To see young people who have been in evangelical Bible-believing churches but have never been taught how to discern based on Scripture... What is wrong with those who have had the experience? And the people who have had experiences are always energetic, always enthusiastic, always want you to participate with them, always want you to come to their rock concerts and, you know, start waving your hands and get into the mood and all that kind of stuff. 
people. I don't know if you've read some of the statistics coming out in various Christian magazines of polls that have been being done. Evangelical Bible-believing churches today, on average, after thousands and thousands and thousands of churches and evangelical Christians have been polled, are losing 85% of their young people when they leave high school. I don't know about you, but that is a very, very dangerous trend. Why? Because they have not been taught sound Bible doctrine in all the areas of Scripture. We understand predestination and election, or at least the, the tiny little bit of it that we can understand in that incredible sovereign purposes of God. I mean, we don't understand the full mind of God, but we at least know that those doctrines are true. And we love to talk about them, and we love to listen to them, and we love to have illustrations and examples of them, of what God is doing both in Scripture and in the world. But folks, there's a lot more in the Scripture that we need to know. Because Satan attacks us where we are weak. He doesn't attack us on our strengths. We know how to fight in the areas of our strengths. We've got our sword sharp in the areas of our strengths. Let me move on. Principle 8. The spiritual gifts are compared to members of a single body. They don't work for themselves. They work for the good of the entire body. Most people think, oh, I've got such and such a gift, and so I feel really pompous and puffed up and proud about it and I'm only going to use it for me. That's not why they were given. Listen, they're given to the individual members of the body for the good of the entire body. Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and following. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, in other words, your hand doesn't do the same thing as your nose, your eyes don't do the same thing as your feet, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. And now he starts, in the very next verse, discussing the spiritual gifts. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. He tells you how to use the gift that God has given you. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 4. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. There are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. The manifestations of the Spirit are the gifts that He's given to us. They're designed to profit with all. That is, to profit everybody in the body, to everybody else. Are given to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh at one and the selfsame Spirit, dividing to every man, here it is again, severally as he wills. Severally means each one of us individually. And he divides as he wills. For as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body, being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. By the way, this is the only place where you find the definition of the baptism of the Spirit. And it is not speaking in tongues, because Paul has already told us that not everybody speaks in tongues. The baptism of the Spirit is whereby you are permanently united to and joined with the invisible body of Christ. You become one of His. You become a member of the body, which is what he's discussing here in this context. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit, for the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? Can you imagine a body 
We have a visitor this morning. He comes rolling in the back door. Weighs 400 pounds and is a gigantic eyeball. Rolls down in the aisle and sits in front. Would you say you've got a body there? That's a very odd visitor. If the whole body is the eyeball. And Paul uses that as an illustration. He says, the same thing is true in the body of Christ. You're not all eyes. You're not all ears. You're not all noses. You're not all hands. You're not all feet. You have different gifts because when they are joined together to form a, a corporate entity, if you will, then they can work in unity and harmony, each doing a different job so that the body is maintained, so that the body functions, so that the body can serve. That's what Paul compares the local church to. Within the invisible sphere, we are members of the body of Christ, but in the context of the local church, God places individual people in each church who have the necessary gifts for that church to function like it's supposed to function as a testimony for Christ in the world. But he goes on. Now are they many members yet one body? Nay, much more of those members of the body which are needful. He says, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more of those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For example, in the context, as Paul has been talking about it, Think about your feet. Now your feet may be calloused. They may be scarred up from having stepped on a nail or something. Maybe your toenails are ingrown. Maybe your feet are really ugly. Most people's feet are really ugly. Now, think about your face. Think about how beautiful, at least at one time, or how handsome you thought you were. Really, really attractive, back in the, the heyday of your youth. Now, if you had to get from here to Philadelphia, and you were walking, what's more important, a beautiful face or a foot that can reach the gas pedal and brake? See, the, the less lovely parts, Paul explains, are oftentimes the more important parts when it comes to the body. Never look down your nose at someone that you think doesn't have as an important a gift as you have. For our comely parts, that is our beautiful parts, have no need. You don't really need a pretty face. But God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. That there should be no schism in the, in the body, that is no division in the body but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. I've given you this illustration before. You see how banged up some of my fingernails are. Some of them are growing back, some of them are not. This one, praise the Lord, is starting to grow back. I got that this last summer, or last a year ago, summer, when we put in the internet fiber optic cable uh, into this building. I was up on a 30-foot ladder outside that corner over there, on a ladder, with a rotary hammer and a two and a half inch pouring bit on a 16-inch extender, cutting through the brick and concrete and block and cement and steel wire to get through the wall up into the attic so that Verizon could come in and run a cable in here and up there and over there so that we could get cables down to our cameras in the balcony. I did it that side, I did it over on the other side of the school building so we can get it across over into the school building too. In the process, as I was holding this heavy machine, it caught and jammed and slammed my finger against an aluminum ladder. Fingernail fell off and what grew back is very, very deformed. Now, when that happened, did the rest of my body say, eh, no big deal, it's his smallest finger. And it's on his left hand, he's right-handed anyway. Or did the entire body agonize in pain? Well, I tell you folks, unless you've ever slammed yourself with a hammer, which I've done many times on this thumb, you may not know what I'm talking about. 
Even the smallest member of the body that hurts, if we are truly connected together as we're supposed to be, to serve Christ together, when one member gets hurt, the whole body hurts. And that's what Paul says here. Whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Years ago, I used to run. I won many races, won many medals, won many trophies, won many blue ribbons and certificates of honor. It was my feet and legs that did most of that work. But you know, the rest of the body actually participated in that. I had arms that were pumping both sides. I had lungs that were breathing in and out and burning like fire. I had a head that was directing everything that was going on down there. I was sweating like mad. My pores were working well. But the honor probably would go to my feet and legs because they're the ones that did the work. But you know, they're not the ones that got the rewards. The entire body did. The whole body rejoiced when there was that honor. And that's what Paul says here should be the truth in the church. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And then he goes on and tells us that list that we've already read about apostles, prophets, teachers, miracles, healings, and so on. And asks the question that responds with a no answer. No, we're not all exactly the same. And then in verse 31 he says, But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show unto you a more excellent way. And many times the charismatics will point you to that verse and say, See, you're supposed to, to covet another gift. You're supposed to pray through and get another gift. No, it's in the plural there. It's talking to the corporate church, not to individuals. You as the church, pray that God will raise up the best gifts in the church. Not that he'll bring you some of those temporary charismatic gifts, which he's no longer giving anyway. But he will raise up from among your midst the very best gifts to serve the church. Well, our time is up. We have much to say yet. The attitude that controls the gifted person is stated. We find um, we move to the other gifts. Pastor, teacher, teacher, governments. This is going to take me forever. I've got to move faster next week. Um, Ruling helps, faith, wisdom, self-control, discerning of spirits, giving, ministration, exhortation, mercy, and hospitality. Most of us don't even know what those gifts are, much less whether or not we have them. But we're going to close there because our time has already passed. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for the privilege of being here today to study your word. How important it is to understand these things because these are the ways in which we minister to one another and in which the body of Christ is built up. How can we effectively reach the world with the good news if we don't even know how we're supposed to function together? Father, we pray that you will take your word, that you will use it in our hearts, that you will cause us to understand that when you give us a call, when you give us a commission, when you give us a command, you give us the empowerment to do it, and then, strangely enough, you expect us to obey. Oh, Father, if we have been disobedient, we pray that you will make us obedient, that we will hear, that we will understand, that we will search the scriptures daily, whether these things are so, that we will believe and obey, that we will not only know in our heads, but that we will apply in our lives the truth of the word of God. Father, we pray for your blessings on each of us as we go forth from this place, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.